Okay. So we haven't made a judgment on that. We will, I would think, sometime in the fall. We'll make a judgment on what we're actually doing on, you know, QE more formally. Right. Uh, uh, and and I, I, I want I personally would like to see how the economy unfolds, what the healthcare response is, how quickly the job market improves. You know, I want to watch what happens to inflation. I want to watch all those things over the next couple of three months as we get through the summer uh, before making a judgment about what the appropriate next step is. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, when I was sort of uh, thinking through and related to QE, but uh, more on the other side on, on Treasury, do you have any thoughts you care to share about the rising amount of U.S. government debt that is uh, sort of taking place at the exact same time? Yeah. So um, before the crisis, if you had heard me speak or read some of the number of things I'd written, I flagged that I was very concerned about record level of corporate debt as an amplifier right. in a downturn. And I was also worried that the level of government debt to GDP, federal government debt to GDP, may well not be sustainable and that we keep growing government debt to GDP. It goes without saying as a result of this crisis, if I was concerned then, we've just Amp, we've just ratcheted all that up uh, in order to deal with this crisis. We had to do it, but but there's no question that government debt to GDP is now higher. Annual deficits will be higher. Uh, then the question is, what's the effect of all that? What's the effect uh, in the long run on tax policy? What's the effect on availability of capital, productivity? Uh, mm -hmm. in years to come. And we're spending a lot of time, and I'm spending a lot of time trying to think that through and understand it. But it's an issue, and it's an issue I'm sure we're going to be talking more about. As, as we get through the crisis and on the other side of the crisis, it's an issue we're going to have to deal with. Uh, and I'm, and I'm, I'm concerned about what are the, uh, what are the consequences of that? I, I think we're, uh, we're going to have to be discussing that. And uh, obviously, inflation pops in into uh, to everyone's mind, at least uh, from a textbook perspective. I, I mean, I, I, I'm a big believer in in sort of like the PCE sort of uh, index, and and what the, you all at the Fed are at least theoretically have as your preferred index. Any any initial thoughts or, or comments yeah. about that? Yeah. So in the near term, and when I say the near term, over the next couple of years. While there's supply constraints, you know, food is costing more, certain food items cost more, availability of meat is an example, and the price of meat. Yes, there are those individual supply side items, but overall, I, my guess is those are going to be overwhelmed by lots of slack in the economy, yep. overcapacity generally. And so my guess is over the next couple of years, most of the forces are going to be disinflationary. And the other thing that's happened, we had technology-enabled disruption into the crisis. A lot of the elements of this crisis may accelerate that. I mean, what I mean by technology replacing people, lack yeah. of pricing power, and new models for goods and services that reduce pricing power. So overall, I think in the next couple of years, you're going to have a, overwhelmingly a lot of a lot of the forces will be disinflationary. And I would I would guess our work here at the Dallas Fed suggests that inflation is going to be pretty muted, not for right. certain individual items. I acknowledge that, but overall right. pretty muted over the next couple of years. The question will be as we get closer, make more progress toward full employment. What what then are the inflationary forces that we're going to see? And we're watching that and try to understand that. But in the near term, I think because we've got so much uh, slack. And you know, people unemployed, excess capacity in the system. Uh, we're going to be dealing with disinflation here for a little while, at least in the medium term. And uh, just for my clarification, medium term, you're th three to five years. Is that a, know, a rough? Be, I don't know. Three to five. I would say certainly for the next couple of years, as long as we've got an elevated level of unemployment and we've got elevated level of overcapacity broadly. Right. Uh, right. Yep. My guess is now then the question is, what's the impact of deglobalization, trying to right. domicile certain capabilities here? How far does that go? Uh, and then supply constraints in certain in, for certain items individual. And then what's the effect of technology enabled disruption? Those are all the factors we're weighing. But for at least the next couple of years, I think most of the forces overwhelmingly will be disinflationary. 
Hmm. Well, touching on technology, I've been informed that uh, some people have had a, a, an issue uh, listening to the beginning part of our discussion. Okay. So, uh, it, would you mind, to, uh, and I'm sorry to ask this, but no, I think it would sorry. be a little set, is just uh, spend a, a moment recapping your assessment of yeah, the U.S. economy as, as we discussed, and then I'll, I'll switch to the Q&A so that gives some everybody a chance to, uh, to reach out okay. to you directly. So for those who didn't hear, the uh, the the second quarter we're we're go, we're going to have a significant historic contraction in the United States, and that means uh, GDP annualized, which means multiplied by four, will be down as much as 35, maybe as high as 40 percent. We'll have to see, but it'll be in the mid 30s at least. Uh, the unemployment rate, we my guess is we already reached the peak of unemployment. Although uh, the U6 measure, U6 is unemployed plus discouraged workers, the people people working part-time who want to work full-time, that's in the low 20s right now. The unemployment rate, our guess is if you include furloughed workers that aren't being paid, that's probably in the mid-teens right now. Having said that, we think between now and the end of the year, we'll grow, we're starting to grow in June, and latter parts of May will grow in the third quarter, will grow in the fourth quarter, and we'll start working down that unemployment rate. And you'll see substantial job growth, I believe, in June, July, and through the summer, okay? Uh, and we'll end the year very likely, though, still with an elevated level of unemployment that's that's 8% or higher. Some people think it could be nine or 10%. My view is it'll be somewhere in the in the eights, and I hope I'm wrong, I hope it's better, but we're still gonna have an elevated level of unemployment. Uh, and I would say most countries in the world that we're watching very carefully, they may be a few months or a few weeks ahead of us, but they're kind of following a similar pattern. They're starting to reopen, they have severe contraction, they're starting to reopen, they're starting to grow. Um, uh, what I also said to you last comment, what I worry now, so monetary policy has played a big role here, Fiscal policy is playing a big role. Probably will need to do more, but I worry that that the, that the healthcare response now is at the forefront. The healthcare response: Do people broadly wear masks? Do we have widespread testing? Do we do good contact tracing when we when people test positive? So we don't have to shut down the whole economy. We just quarantine, you know, in in isolated areas. If we do that well and we follow good procedures. You know, we we could maybe see people re-engage faster, you know, get on planes sooner, uh, re-engage in the service sector faster. If we don't do it well, and we see the rise in cases or elevated cases, which we're seeing uh, because we have lax procedures or uneven procedures, we're going to grow more slowly because individuals are making every day these trade-off decisions about how much risk they want to take and what they want to do. The more they, the more they feel confident to re-engage, will grow faster. So there is no dis dichotomy or disconnect between good healthcare procedures and growth. They go together. The better we do those things, the faster it will grow. And in that regard, I'd say our practices have been far more uneven than other countries. Other countries. Are, are seem to be uh, having more widespread adoption of, of strict practice. And because of that, I think their chance to grow faster and right. have a lower rate of unemployment will be better. And we can fix this, but, uh, but I flag it everywhere I go because it, it, why not spend hundreds of millions of dollars on this or even billions to avoid spending trillions right. on more monetary and fiscal policy. It's it's the highest return on equity investment we could make right now is in good right. practices, starting with yeah. wearing a mask and expensive availability of these N95 masks and PPE. That that's a that's a that's as good a use of money as we can as we could have right now. Right. Well, thank you very much. Um, in in interest of uh, of uh, having all our participants have a chance to also ask uh, President Kaplan on your uh, on your sort of GUI, you'll see that there's a a, a question box. Uh, please feel free to uh, to reach out with questions. I will do my best uh, to both be brief and swift, but also try and get to as many as many questions as we can. And again, thank you, President Kaplan, for for allowing this. Um, first question that comes uh, right off the top is. Uh, Thoughts, 
concerns, uh, discussion points on the concept of yield curve targeting that has been uh, bandied about over the yeah. last couple of, let's yeah. say, weeks, months. It has been, and and it is something that will that I think we should look at at the Fed. I have certain concerns about it, uh, but I I wouldn't rule it out. Uh, but right now, uh, Treasury yields are relatively muted. Um, yield curve control involves uh, targeting a level of rates, probably probably on shorter maturities, uh, maybe tying it to certain economic outcomes. But my only concern is uh, I'm open to discussing it more and looking at it more, but I worry also about creating distortions or yeah. more distortions in the financial markets. Obviously, we've done what we've what we've done up to now to try to stabilize the markets. I worry about uh, going too far uh, in terms of uh, distorting the the pricing mechanism of the Treasury curve. Um, and I'm not saying we shouldn't do it, but I think I'd have to see evidence that there's a reason to do it. Uh, if we see, you know, if, 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 if the, we have to weigh the costs and the benefits. And right now I'm in the uh, stage for me of uh, having a little skepticism, but wanting to continue to explore it. Yeah, willing to listen, I would guess. Yeah. Um, uh, additionally, and and, slightly connected with this. Uh, President Kaplan, what are your general thoughts on MMT? Well, if you'd asked me this question uh, four or five months ago, pre-crisis, um, right. I'd say, and, and we ha I've talked to lots of other people about it, and you know, the feedback you get from most economists is, it's crazy, it's not well thought through, it's, it's, very da it's extremely dangerous, and I would have echoed all that. Unfortunately, because of the crisis, we have actually taken a number of steps which uh, are, are heading into new territory. Uh, and so we've done some version of, of MMT to some extent right. to deal with this crisis. And I think the, the challenge is, I don't think the implications of, the, of MMT were well understood before, and I was concerned about them. And now that we've done some of these things, I continue to be concerned about them, and we're gonna have to reckon with what are the implications. And so what does that mean to me? It means in a crisis, you do what you need to do. Right. But as we come out, hopefully, God willing, out of this crisis, I think, I think it'd be wise to show some restraint and to assess the implications of what we've done so far before we make our next move. And, uh, and, and, and so that's where I would be uh, because of, uh, of the extensive nature of, of a number of the things that we've done. Right, very good, thank you. Um, next question, do you see forward guidance evolving uh, on an outcome-based direction or using more calendar-based guidance? Or do you think maybe it'll be a bit more of a hybrid approach and sort of see how it develops over time? Or, or do you think having a locked, uh, maybe not a locked, it's too strong of a word, but a framework that you go with uh, for the time being? So uh, let's let's start with I think forward guidance is a valuable tool that we have, okay. Mm -hmm. And and I, I normally would have said that forward guidance based on um, reaching our dual mandate goals of full employment and price stability is appropriate. Uh, uh, having said that, uh, I could see situations where calendar based guidance, you know, that we're going to basically give give assurance we're going to keep rates low for X period of time, and then we'll revisit mm -hmm. at the end of that time where we stand. But I think it's going to probably be a mix. But I think it's very important that if you're going to give forward guidance, it should be tied to outcomes. Uh, there may be a calendar-based element to it to give people a sense of duration. But I, I think it should be based on achieving our dual mandate objectives. And it's a tool that we are using now, and uh, I think we'll continue to use. What I don't want to do is make a forward commitment, you know, for an extensive period of time to do something, you know, without right. a chance to revisit it uh, and make sure we understand what the side effects are. So what's an example? Uh, you know, I worry about financial stability, uh, impact on the markets. I think that's right. an example where you want to at least give yourself the ability to call time out, even though you're giving forward guidance and, and assess 
what the financial stability implications are of what we're doing and other side effects that maybe we hadn't foreseen. Yeah, that's a, it's a good point because uh, actually a few questions that have been coming in specifically uh, address that. Just uh, let's I'm going to paraphrase as best as I can here, but just uh, with rates already so low, effectiveness of monetary policy over time and unintended consequences, as, as you rightly pointed. Yeah, I'm concerned about that. And, and listen, we're we're at the stage here where I think I talked about fiscal policy being important, but a lot of structural reforms in addition are going to be important. What do I mean by structural reform? Improving educational attainment among Blacks and Hispanics in the United States and other at-risk groups. That's a structural reform, which I think is going to be critical to GDP growth. Uh, finding ways to grow the workforce faster, improve productivity. Those are structural reforms, which may be mm -hmm. as more important than monetary policy or even fiscal policy, uh, although they'll require some money, fiscal policy. And then I mentioned another example, how this healthcare, you know, if, 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 if a great thing happens and we, we see more progress on the healthcare front than we're expecting with either a treatment or a vaccine, that's something you have to at least be open to that that, I, I, I don't know that it will happen. I think you'd be wise not to count on it, but it could happen. So there could be positive surprises as well as negative surprises. And I think having an open mind uh, and showing some restraint to see how this unfolds is, I, for me, I think a wise course of action. Right. Um, I guess, uh, and again, I'm going to try and do my best to sort of uh, bring a few questions together that all have sort of the same thematic structure to it. But basically, the Fed is cu currently conducting a review of its framework, by and large, yeah. if, if, if I'm not mistaken. Can yeah. you discuss what this review entails, what, what your thoughts are related to this uh, this process? Yes. So I felt, listen, I'm a business person. I'm not an economist. I'm a business person. So I've all, I've felt strongly ever since I joined the Fed about five years ago that um, any successful organization, every X period of time does a re-review of its policies, its procedures, its governance, its frameworks. And so mm -hmm. I've been a big advocate of this. And so we we're doing that framework review. Uh, and and in, in our case, what we were looking at is the dual mandate objective. Is that still the right objective? Uh, we've been uh, we've been running undershooting our inflation objective now for many years since the financial crisis. Are there other frameworks or approaches we should be using so we meet our inflation target? Uh, now, now a lot of people say, why would you want to? Why would you want to have more inflation? Well, because the counter. Uh, if, if I told you that GDP growth, nominal GDP growth, nominal income is how we pay the rent, is how we service. If I told you, you, you know, you've got lower growth and depressed, you know, or deflation or disinflation, that just means lower nominal GDP growth, which is less money to service all this debt we have. So it's not, it's, it's, I, always, I think of inflation and related to nominal growth. So we've got to look at that if we're undershooting, are there some smart things we could do? So the framework review is to try to think through our frameworks and take that into account. And the other thing I, I like to see formally in our framework is a, is a formal explicit consideration of financial stability, meaning monetary policy and accommodation is not free. Uh, right. Distortions, effect on savers, crowding out potentially, uh, business dynamism effects, effects of creating businesses that should be restructured but aren't, the so-called zombie businesses, all those side effects and financial stability should be explicitly considered. So those are the kinds of issues, at least for me, that we're discussing and that we will, uh, we will, we will come forward with uh, some enhancements, I think, to our framework. The other thing we looked at is the way we communicate, the SCP, how well, how right. we communicate, how we do that. And I think we'll make some improvements to that also. Do you guys have an understanding of when you think the uh, the reevaluation will be done in, in the next couple of months? Or is it a, uh, for the time being, it's, it's a you work know, in progress? It's been, it, it, it's been delayed because of the crisis, but I would expect before the end of the year, in the next several months, I would be hopeful that we'll, uh, we'll, say, we'll be saying more on the framework. Review. Obviously the crisis sort of put that off to the side, for some right. period of time, but we haven't we haven't gotten away from it. And we'll come back. We're coming back to it. 
Yeah, and I guess lastly, to to for at least from my perspective, to end up on a high note, um, what specifically would you look at in the economy coming down the pipe? And obviously, there's the low hanging fruit like continue unemployment drop, things of that nature. But that really is the stuff that would sort of like say, hey, that's something that's now starting to you know make a difference in my calculus and how I think about it. So what I'm looking at more and more, and I'm not alone. I think this is widespread is there's a lot of new data sources we never used to have. Mobility data, yeah. smartphone data, uh, credit card data, okay? So I'm watching, I'm on the phone uh, or I'm meeting with my team uh, every week discussing what's the latest on credit card spending. Where are we versus a year ago? That's improved, by the way, pretty significantly. What's going on with mobility? That's also improving. So what we're we're looking at that stuff every time it comes out, because I think that'll foreshadow what's going on with the jobs market. Uh, and then the other thing I would say, the most important uh, thing I look at, probably still more important than anything else, is my discussions with businesses and community leaders. And so, for example, I knew from all my discussions with businesses the last month or two, that they were working hard to figure out how to turn their PPE loans, PPP loans into grants. And the only yeah. one way to do that, bring back employees. So we we knew there was a chance that you might get some front end loading to job growth. And so while I was surprised how positive it was, we weren't completely shocked. And we think a lot of that had to do with the effectiveness of the PPP and people wanting to bring back employees. I'm also aware of all my discussions with businesses that that isn't the final verdict on those jobs. Now that they brought people back, some of those people are not working full time. A lot of them are working part time. Some of them are even still drawing unemployment if they work less hours than they did before. And so there's going to be a gut check. I, I can tell you talking to businesses in August or September in the next few months where they're going to gauge how how much is demand for my business? What is the right, right. size of my business? Everything is on the table for businesses I talk to. And so I'm I'm conscious, whatever the data says, We've got this gut check coming sometime in August or September, you know, as we go on through the year. Uh, mm -hmm. And this is, again, why I'll, I'll end on this note, because the most important thing I'm going to say today is about the healthcare response. If people wear masks widely, if we have extensive testing and contact tracing, if businesses and us as individuals follow good procedures, we're going to grow faster. It's more likely when that gut check happens businesses are going to say, you know what, we've had enough resurgence in demand. We, we, don't, we, we can keep most of our people, you know, or more than we might have thought. But a lot of it is going to depend on the healthcare policies and healthcare responses. And again, it's uneven. I can tell you firsthand through the United States in different cities and states. But to the extent we can do that better, we are going to grow faster. And I think we're going to get higher GDP and lower unemployment. And so I'm most acutely focused on that right now uh, because uh, it's at the forefront of how quickly we recover from this pandemic. Right. Well, on that note, thank you very much, President Kaplan. It's very, Thanks, we really appreciate you spending the time and, and providing us with the insights. And we look forward to having you back in the future and be safe and uh, everyone out there be safe as well. And thank you for joining us today. Thank Have you. Have a great Good day, sir. Thanks, Alan. You too. Bye-bye.